Hey guys, and thank you so much for watching. If you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, we'd really appreciate it if you would. Today we're going to take a look at doing a custom PC build, start to finish, all the parts associated, how you put them together, and some good tips as far as do's and don'ts. A little background on me, I'm an IT professional with over 10 years with my current company, but I've been building computers for over 20 years now. I'm pretty particular about brands that I use for a lot of these parts and we'll talk about each brand and why, and I'll also mention some other brands that I like as well. I'll try to go into as much detail as I can and we'll try to go through each part as we go. I do want to recommend doing this at your own risk. Uh, I will not be liable for any issues that you may have or if you break any components or cause any damage or harm to yourself, others, or any of the computer pieces as well. Uh, there are risks associated with building computers, you know, there are capacitors, there's electrical, so I do recommend if you're not confident in doing so, have a friend or someone that's got experience with it help you out as well, just because I wouldn't want anybody to get hurt. As far as this computer, we're going to do a custom Intel Core i7 with all the parts that you see here. This is an Antec P101 silent case. It is a very large case, and this is for more of like a CAD design system. So this is not a gaming rig by any means. This doesn't have clear side panels, RGB lighting, and a lot of extras like that. Um, I find those to be a little frivolous. There's nothing wrong with that stuff if you like it, but for business, it just doesn't really fit, and this is definitely going to be a business PC build. That said, everything I'm going to go over with you would apply to most gaming rigs as well, except for water cooling and some things like that. We're going to use an EVGA 750 fully modular power supply on this one. A lot of the reason I'm going to use this one is just to minimize the amount of cabling. So it's going to minimize the amount of cable management we have to do. These EVGA Golds are really good quality power supplies. That's not to say they're the only good power supplies out there. This is a Cooler Master CPU cooler. This is going to work on a lot of different Intel and AMD platforms. It's just kind of my go-to. It's got a big fan on it. Uh, does a really good job with the heat pipes and just a really nice product. I've only ever had issues with like one of these out of more builds than I can count, probably over 50. And it was just a fan issue with the PWM signal and we'll talk about that more later. Uh, luckily, we were able to get an ASUS RTX 3060 Ti. Uh, obviously these are extremely hard to get right now and uh, they're a really nice card. This is going to be used for graphic rendering for like walkthroughs and stuff after CAD designs are done. I've got some examples of thermal paste and some uh, cleaning products up here. This is the new Samsung Pro 980 NVMe SSD. NVMe is going to be your fastest type of hard drive interface without going to a full PCI Express card and this is what I'm going to recommend for most consumer builds and commercial builds that aren't like servers or things that do just insane throughput. And that said, the throughput on this thing is pretty insane. If you have a two and a half inch SATA type hard drive, this is more than five times faster than most of those. And then if you've got a spinning type SATA drive, this could be 25 or more times faster than that. So, I mean, very, very powerful, very good quality. And Samsung, I honestly think makes the best. Um, the Western Digitals are good as well, and SanDisk, which are really the same thing actually, Western Digital and SanDisk for the SSDs, but the Samsungs, if you look at the benchmarks, they're going to be you know, some of the fastest, and in my experience, they have a very, very low failure rate. There's a million people in the game with SSDs and RAM, but none of them really make, or very few of them really make the product. There's only a handful of companies in the world that actually make the silicone that go on these things. So most of them are just repackaging other people's stuff or they're taking chips from another manufacturer, soldering them to a board, putting out a controller and sending it out. Um, Samsung, again, I think does the best as far as the cost benefit as well. They're not the cheapest, especially not this Pro, but like their Evo series and the standard 980s are really good quality too. And, you know, the 980 SSD uh, Pro version is going to be, you know, one of their fastest. Uh, as far as the CPU, we're going to do an Intel Core i7 on this. This one is unlocked, though we're not going to be overclocking because, again, this is commercial. This isn't for gaming. And honestly, overclocking, unless you're going to do a lot of cooling, isn't necessarily a good idea. You're probably going to shorten the life of your system and CPU especially, unless you're cooling it very well. You're going to bake the thermal paste more quickly and need to replace it more often. 
and you know water cooling is great and you know I'm sure there's a ton of videos with guys doing crazy gaming builds with water cooling but it's expensive there's a lot of hassle to it it's not as dangerous as it used to be because back in the day you had to do all your own terminations which most people aren't doing anymore uh, but that said you know it does add a lot of complication to your build you really have to get a case that's outfitted to fit your radiators and such so it's just not something i'm into very often this is an asus prime motherboard uh, i think asus makes the best motherboards on the market there's a lot of different versions all their tough uh, items like this video card come with you know better capacitors the prime stuff does as well um, the quality of the capacitors on there really does matter cheap capacitors are not going to last very long and these prime boards knock on wood i've done more builds with different models of prime boards than i you know can even tell you and i've never had one go bad that said all these things are sensitive electronics and you could tear it up uh, this is Corsair Vengeance Memory. I think Corsair, especially for the money in a desktop style build like this, is the best out there. Um, Samsung is very good as well, and for servers, I'm usually using Samsung ECC or Error Correction Checking RAM, uh, but on a, a desktop, you can't really use registered DIMMs usually, and this Corsair Vengeance, I think, for the money especially, I wouldn't go with anything else. This is a lower profile. It doesn't have big crazy heat sinks on it. That way we don't interfere with any of the space for this cooler here. And it's very fast. Of course, this is DDR4. And as far as the speed, this is 3200. You can get faster RAM. Most of it's overclocked though. And again, for a desktop regular build, I just don't see that much point in going with overclocking and stuff like that. So as I already said, all these brands, this is really the best stuff I think out there, but it's not the only stuff I recommend. Gigabyte and MSI motherboards are good as well. I just think Asus is the best. Uh, as far as RAM, like I said, Samsung is good. Micron Crucial RAM is really good. Uh, there's a ton of players out there. Even Hynix is not bad. Uh, and I do see that in a lot of factory systems and even some servers. Uh, but there are other brands you know, that are less quality that I don't recommend. And video cards, uh, pretty much the same as motherboards, Gigabyte, Asus, and MSI are going to be some of your best. And of course, EVGA is, I think, top notch as far as video cards. Uh, their power supplies are good too. So are Cooler Master, so are Thermaltake, Antec. There's a lot of good Seasonic out there. As far as power supplies, though, generally speaking, you want to go with something that's gold rated if you can afford it, because that's just going to be the best quality. And then also, if it came with a case, unless it's a manufacturer that made both like Antec or Cooler Master, it's probably an inferior product if it comes together and pre-assembled. If it's got a name on there you've never heard of or it's something really obscure and a small brand, it's probably just not that good a quality. And that said, you know, it might, may not last because of that. However, it could also damage your equipment. The regulation in a power supply matters a lot to protect all your other components. So because of that, you really want to make sure you go with a good quality brand and a good, good model as well. I like the fully modular ones just so that you can keep the case nice and tidy, uh, but also you really have to size the power supply correctly for your system. This G-Force here requires the 750 uh, watt power supply. You could go higher. Higher won't hurt you, but lower will. So you could do an 800, an 850, 1000, 1500 watts for all that matters. Those get really expensive, and honestly, you don't need it uh, for the most part either. So I would base it mostly on what video card you have and what they recommend as the minimum wattage. That said, all these components draw power. It's just most of them, the side of the CPU and the video card, don't draw that much. You know, the SSD is only a couple of watts. RAM is probably like 10 watts. So most of the components just don't require much power. So you don't have to worry about it from those aspects very much. As far as the RAM, uh, like I said, I like Corsair Vengeance the best. Uh, and there are other good brands out there too. And I don't really recommend going for the overclock RAM unless you really think you need it. And then motherboard wise, I mean, there's a million of them, but the biggest thing you need to make sure of is that the processor, the RAM and the motherboard all are made to work together. They don't need to be the same brand. In fact, they usually won't be, but you do need to make sure that you check the CPU support list uh, for what CPUs a motherboard will support. You'll also notice that in that support list, it's gonna change over time. Intel or AMD is gonna come out with new processors and they're gonna 
put out BIOS updates for these motherboards to accept the newer processors in a lot of cases. That said, the generations don't always move forward. So like this right here is gonna be an 11700K i7. So it's an 11th gen. The 11 on 11700 means 11th gen. So most motherboards are only gonna support like 10th and 11th gen. They're not gonna go back to 789. So these two pieces are gonna be fairly tied together. And when the 13th or 14th gen i7s come out, it's not gonna work on this board. So you're gonna to have to replace it. As far as RAM, it's a little less specific. They will give you a list in a lot of cases of RAM that has been tested with the board. I don't really worry too much about that. What I concern myself with is that it's the right size, a full size DIMM, not a little laptop so DIMM, because this is a desktop build, and then the speed. So if you look at on the motherboard you know, manufacturer's website, and even on Intel's website with the CPU, they'll kind of tell you what speed RAM they recommend. For both of these, the 3200 is great. You could go higher, you know, you could go with overclock RAM, 3666, you know, whatever, but it's just gonna detune it to being 3200 anyway, unless you start messing around with settings on the motherboard to try to push that RAM higher and hotter. Hotter is kind of the key here. When you push a CPU or RAM or even overclocking a video card harder, you're generating more heat, and that's the enemy of the electronics. You really don't want to create unnecessary heat that you can't dissipate because that's what's going to literally cook your equipment. I've got some tools here as well just to kind of show you, you know, what I... I uh, typically use. Uh, multiple sizes of zip ties. You can use Velcro ties and other things as well. I'm a big fan of zip ties, hence the name. Uh, Phillips head screwdriver. There's almost no need for a flat head in any builds I do. I really like flush cutters for cutting zip ties. You can cut them with anything. You can cut them with scissors or a, you know, a pair of uh, uh, lineman's pliers or something, but these cut them very flush so that way if you get a good flush cut, the part isn't hanging out that you cut off and therefore you don't cut yourself up. I've been in racks and stuff that people don't use proper cutters and you come out looking like somebody, you know, a tiger was clawing at you or something. Um, I really do recommend using shop towels, not paper towels. The shop towels dust a lot less. Um, they're just better quality. They don't tear up as easily, so that's nice. And then I've got a small old school Husky set um, that's kind of a ratchet deal. And this is for putting the studs on the risers and the case uh, that are gonna hold the motherboard down. I've uh, been using this one a long time. They make them that are screwdrivers as well. There's a million ways to do it, but I do recommend not just doing it with your fingers, and we'll go over that here in a moment. I really like the Noctua thermal paste, but my favorite is gonna be the Arctic thermal paste. And you can use what comes with a CPU cooler, like this Cooler Master is gonna come with just a little baby tube. And it's okay, but it's not the best, so I'd rather go ahead and get it done right the first time. So I'm gonna use the Arctic Thermal Compound. And then they make a surface purifier and a cleaner. I'm not gonna use the cleaner today because there's not thermal paste already on anything. But if you're reapplying, you can use the cleaner that's part of their system. And then the surface purifier is gonna get any residual cleaner off the CPU and the underside of the cooler. It's going to make sure that any oils from the cleaner, from your skin, from any contaminants come off because the marriage between the CPU and the cooler with thermal paste in between is what's going to allow it to cool properly. That said, you don't want to overdo it with thermal paste. That's a huge mistake I see you know, individuals make. Companies have even made it and have had to have recalls because of it. So you want to use enough but not too much. More is not always better, and we'll go over how to do that you know, properly. There's many ways to do it, though. Getting started with the case, we're just going to take off both side panels. These do have thumb screws. Sometimes they are on there a little too tight, so because of that, you may have to use a screwdriver or something in order to get them off. On this model, once you take them off, you just kind of pull them aside, and it pops off. Same with the other one. A lot of these cases, they actually slide front to back, but this one they just kind of pull off. Inside, you can see they've got a little bit of information. This one is the Antec P101 Silent. I'm a huge fan of Antec cases, and this is one that I use all the time because most of my clients are businesses, and they don't want to listen to a bunch of fans running. So because of that, this one's going to stay nice and cool, but also be very quiet. There's actually dampening in the sides of this case, too. 
I've used many different Antec cases. They are of a really good quality. There are other good ones as well. I've used uh, Corsair, uh, Cooler Master, Fractal Design, and Silverstone. I've also used some really cheap cases over the years. A lot of people like to ask, you know, why does it matter? Why does the quality of the case matter? There's two big reasons for me. Number one, the fact that they roll these corners over, it's called cold rolled steel, and you won't cut yourself on a good quality case. Like these edges are not sharp. On cheapo cases, all of these are stamp cut, so they're super sharp. You're gonna lacerate your hands, you know, trying to work on the case. And when it comes to a custom build, it's one of those things that you're probably gonna be back in here, you know, a few other times throughout the life of the computer or upgrading parts. So I just don't wanna take the risk. I'd rather spend a few extra bucks, get a better quality case and not cut myself in the process. Now, all the cases are gonna come with some screws and standoffs and Antec. They put them down here in a little box. This guy holds one five and a quarter and a bunch, two, four, six, eight, three and a half inch drives. There's also a place for two two and a halfs on the back. Of course, you could adapt these to two and a halfs if you wanted to. You could adapt this to uh, four two and a halfs. You could adapt this to a, another three and a half. So there's a million options with what you can do on this case. Also, they've isolated where the power supply goes inside of here. There are holes to pass it through on the outside and on the inside, but I do like that as well. That way you're not creating heat that's going up into the rest of the system from the power supply. So that's just kind of a cool design. On the back side here, you can see a big cutout for the back of the motherboard. That's really for the cooler. A lot of coolers need a bracket to hold them on here. And so they've cut this out nice and big, still nicely rolled edges, so I'm not cutting myself. These are the mounts for the two and a half inch drives, and you know they do have screws holding them in. Uh, you could do solid state or spinning drives in these. And honestly, you could build you know a server in this case if you wanted to, uh, but we're actually gonna take out all the three and a half inch drive uh, brackets because we're not gonna use any of them. And I know that makes it seem like a waste for the size of this case. However, cooling is key. You can see we've got big exhaust fan back there. And then on the front, there's a door. There's a filter, which again, cheap cases usually don't have a filter. And there's three really good size 120 millimeter cooling fans here on the front. So we're gonna take out all these three and a half inch bays just so that we get better airflow through because the whole idea here is to cool it very well at low speed fans so you don't have to listen to them run. Other cases will have you know, fan spots on the top or even on this side to pull you know, heat out as well. And again, for gaming and overclocking and all that fancy stuff, a lot of that's a good idea because you want to get the heat out. This has three intake fans and the one exhaust fan, and I think it does a great job. I also like where the Cooler Master is going to end up in here because it's going to point right at this rear exhaust fan as well. So I'm going to take all these guys out and then we'll get started on fitting the motherboard. So I've removed all those three and a half inch enclosures and I removed the two and a half inch enclosures from the back as well, just because we're not going to need them on this build. I did want to show you some examples though. This is a two and a half inch solid state SSD. Um, this one's SATA and then this is a traditional spinning SATA two and a half inch drive. Both of those could have been mounted on the back, at least on this case. Now this is the slowest type of hard drive. This is a SSD, but it is a slower type of SSD because it's SATA, and then we're gonna use the NVMe drive today. There's also these three and a half inch hard drives, and that's what all these carriers here would have held. You can use them individually or in an array. We're not gonna go into detail today on what that means, but these drives are at least a little bit better than the spinning two and a half inch drives. They're still SATA, uh, but they still are kind of a necessary thing. SATA uh, SSDs only go up to like four terabytes these days, or at least right now. And these, you can get these up to 14, 16, 18, even some 20 terabyte in just one drive. They are slower, but of course they hold a lot more data. So there are still good purposes of using spinning drives. However, in this build, we're just gonna have a single M2 disc, so we don't need any of these. I poured all of the screws that came with the Antec case into this old Altoids tin, and I put all the extra screws that held those cradles on from the back in here as well. The main things we're gonna look for first are these little standoffs. Uh, basically, it's these guys that hold the motherboard up off 
the tray here. These are really important because they're what support the motherboard. And I see these left off all the time. Maybe they won't all be on there or they'll be in the wrong places. And that could short out your board. So that's a big deal. You wanna make sure you get these on there correctly. Again, just hand tightening them by putting them in this hole and you know going with your fingers is not really enough because if you take a screw and you use a screwdriver to put it in, you could lock the screw into this guy and then when you go to take it out, if you ever need to, it's going to back out of this back plate instead of taking the screw out of the standoff. So I'm going to use a little ratchet. Um, they make a lot of different styles. You can get these that are like a little screwdriver, of course, like a little socket wrench. But this style is going to be good for motherboards and you just kind of twist it. You don't want to be, you know, really hard on it. Don't give it a whole lot of torque just because you don't want to strip it out. This is still, you know, just regular steel. And I am just going to go ahead and check all the ones that were already in the motherboard just because, or for the motherboard in the case, because you don't want to trust that the factory got all those right. So that's going to be important. You want to handle the motherboard very carefully. You don't want to touch surfaces unnecessarily. And another thing I see people do all the time incorrectly, or that they forget to do, is leaving all this plastic stuff on there. So you really want to take this off. These have little poles that are supposed to pull the cellophane off. You can see this one already did not work. So I'm going to have to go and pull this one off with my fingernails. And if you don't have fingernails, this can be really difficult. There's one on the rear I.O. shield as well. And you want to get all these off ahead of time. You don't want to wait till it's already in the case because if you wait that long, there's a good chance it's going to be even harder to get in there and get this done. Um, I do have fingernails, so I'm able to get them off, but it is challenging. There's one on this M2 heat spreader here as well. And then there's one on the side. Asus goes a little crazy with it. I think they're just trying to protect it since all this stuff is white. They're trying to keep it from getting marred up or scratched up as well as uh, just keep that nice finish. Because again, so many people do cases with a clear side panel and so people really care that all that stuff looks nice. I'm gonna keep putting it down on the bag that it came in. It is an anti-static bag. Again, that's just to try to protect it, just because you don't wanna cause any you know, shorts or issues. Uh, static electricity is certainly a factor here. I don't really recommend doing a PC build standing on carpet because of that. And if you really wanna get you know, particular about it or technical about it, you're supposed to wear one of these. This is a wrist strap. And basically, it just grounds you with this to the case of, or whatever you're working on. So you would wanna have bare metal. In this case, it doesn't really have any bare metal. It's all painted, so it's not really gonna work in this build, um, but you would put it on your wrist and that would ground your skin to the metal so that there shouldn't be any static charge or difference of potential. That said, I'm not going to worry about it on this one. Again, do all this at your own risk. I've been building computers for 20 years and have never blown one up you know, with static electricity. But the way that I combat that is to touch metal, bare metal especially, before I touch a part. And that way I'm going to discharge anything into that steel or metal, you know, even aluminum, before I touch anything sensitive. The other stuff with the motherboard you want to keep in mind is the rear I.O. shield. This motherboard, it's built on right here. So there's nothing to do when I put this in. It's going to fill this spot in the case and it's going to line up. However, other motherboards, older motherboards and some cheaper motherboards, this is a separate piece. And this comes to another thing I see people do wrong all the time. They'll get the motherboard installed and forget to put this in. This snaps into the rear location on the back of the case here, and that's what's going to line up with all your ports. I really like that ASUS, especially on these primes, include that on here, and that way I don't have to worry about forgetting to do it. And these, honestly, they're kind of junk. They're soft, they're aluminum, and they're very easy to bend and break. They're also a little sharp on the edges. And again, I like these nice cases so I don't have to deal with sharp edges. So just something to keep in mind as well. Um, so first thing we're going to do is figure out where these need to line up for each of these little feet on the case for this specific motherboard. Now again, I've done multiple builds you know, with these parts, so I'm pretty familiar with it. If you look across the top, you have one, two, three, one, two, and then number three right here, we don't have. So we're going to add that one to this case. Again, we're going to take one of the standoffs from here, 
We're going to start it with our fingers where it belongs, just so we don't get it cross-threaded or anything. It would be hard for me to do blind here. And then once it's in there started, we're going to use a ratchet to get it down in there. And again, don't go super tight on these. Just get them snug so that you don't want to uh, waller out the hole, you know, and strip the hole, but you don't want this to back out when you're taking the screw out. The other thing I recommend is go ahead and grab some of the screws. There are multiple kinds that are going to come with your case, and there are fine thread and coarse thread. And as far as the difference, if you look at it, you can actually see the thread sizes. I know you're not going to be able to see them from over there, but the threads are really, really tiny on this one and more coarse on this one. Most of your exterior case screws, your three and a half inch hard drives, they're going to use these more coarse threads where there's very few threads per inch and they do stick out further. They're more aggressive looking. And then these fine threads, this is what two and a half inch hard drives are going to use and uh, CD drives and then some of your internal case stuff. I would always recommend taking one of your standoffs and taking a screw and figuring out ahead of time which one it is. On the Santec case, it's a fine thread. On a lot of cases, it's a coarse thread. So you want to be sure you've got the right screw for your standoff, because if you wait until you're putting the motherboard in, you could get a screw stuck, you could strip the standoff, you know, especially if you're using a screwdriver, and then you're going to be in trouble. So we've got our three here. We have three here because I added that one, and I just already know we're going to need one down here. Now, you'll probably want to lay the case down on its back when you do this. I'm just holding it up or doing it vertical so that you all can see better. But you really want to be able to get this done, you know, more easily. And again, if I look at the motherboard here, I've got two and one. There's two in line with those in the middle and one. And then again, two and one. Some motherboards have one right here. This one doesn't. But you'll see this case does have a location for another one there. Now to get the motherboard in there, you want to you know, lay the case on its back, line this up, and then start putting in the screws. Uh, the other problem I see that when people do this is they put a screw in and they tighten it down and then they go to the next one. That's a big no-no. You really want to set this in there, start each screw just a little bit just so the motherboard can settle and everything can kind of get aligned before you start tightening screws down. Be, the, there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, the card slots need to line up properly. And so if you get this and it's too far off kilter up, down, or to one side, then the slot for the card, like your graphics card, is not going to line up with the slot here. And that takes us to another reason why I like quality cases. A lot of this is cheaper stuff. And because of that, the tolerances are not that great. So when you go to put something in, like a motherboard, you know, into a cheap case, it's not going to line up right, and you're going to have a lot more trouble. And I'd rather spend a few extra dollars and have a better product that I don't have to deal with problems like that. Another mistake I see people make is the rear mount for a big cooler like this. On some cases, you have to have already put that on before you put the motherboard in. It doesn't have this nice big hole in it. So because of that, if you forget to do it, put the motherboard in, then realize it, you have to pull the board right back out, put a bracket on the back, and then put it all back together. This again has a built-on I.O. shield, but these little cheesy ones like this are very problematic. Because they have little spring-loaded feet here, what I see happen all the time is when people go to line this thing up, especially on USBs, part of that middle will literally go into the USB port on this board. And you could short it and blow the board up or all your components up when you do that. So again, another reason why I love this one, but just be sure, you know, when you put an IO shield on your case and then you put the motherboard in, that nothing is protruding into any of the holes. Of course, this one is not for this model, so it doesn't line up at all. Um, you could put the CPU in now, or you can wait until it's in the case. Either way, you know, is okay. However, I really recommend not taking the little cover off where the CPU goes until you're ready to put the CPU in. Personally, I'm going to wait until the motherboard is installed to even try to install the CPU, just because I've done this a lot and I know it's going to be easier then. Also on this board, take note of 
three PCI Express X16s. There's an X4. This one doesn't have X1s, but that's not a big deal. Um, I don't really need them, and of course they'll fit in any of these. But there are two M2 slots, uh, one under each heat spreader. And so what we'll do when we're ready is take the screws out and install the M2 card on the motherboard as well. Um, this one has heat spreaders on both. Some have no heat spreaders. Some of them it's only on one. And as to which one you use, same with RAM, you want to refer to the motherboard manual. Now they're going to give you this online or a physical, and then you'll see there's also a support disc. I know DVD or CD is pretty outdated, but they do include this with your motherboard, or at least ASUS does. But you really want to refer to this book to make sure you're doing everything correctly as far as which M2 slot you use, because one of them might support uh, an X3 you know, or a, a X2 interface versus an X4 speed, or one of them may be PCIe 2.0 or 3.0 instead of 4.0. Also, M2s are not inherently PCI Express NVMe. There are M2s that are SATA type and M2 drives that are NVMe type. And so the manual is going to tell you which slot to use for which type. So if you're having any issues with it, you know, look up the model of M2 drive you purchased. Of course, this one's going to be NVMe. And then you look in the manual to know which slot to use and, uh, you know, which slot's going to match its speed best. When in doubt, you would go with the slot with the faster interface. So if one of them's an X2 and the other's an X2, X4, I would put the card in the X4 because that's going to be the better one. And even if the card only does X2 speed, it's just going to down clock it to that X2 speed anyway, so it's not really that big a deal. So we'll go ahead and get this motherboard installed in the case, and then we'll look at doing the CPU cooler, CPU thermal paste, and all those other components. So we're going to start with taking the motherboard, putting it inside the case here and just trying to make sure that all our screw holes do line up and that we're ready to go. Just make sure there's no other cables in your way. And sure enough, this fan cable is in my way. Okay, so as I said earlier, these are the fine thread, at least on this ASUS case. So we're going to, I mean Antec case. So I'm going to take a screwdriver and just start one screw into one of the standoffs. I'm going to make sure it's all lining up. Then we're going to go ahead and do all the rest of them one at a time. And we're just going to do them loosely so that everything can kind of settle before we get to hunkering down on these screws. That way I know everything is lining up as well as it can and so that we don't have any issues down the road with getting our slots, you know, cards like the video card to line up too. You'll see that, you know, sometimes this stuff gets a little warped. You know, it's not the best quality. Uh, back when these were made in the United States or Japan, I feel like the quality was a little bit better, but you know, it is what it is these days. So we're just gonna start these outer ones first, and then we're gonna work our way in, just one at a time, nice and slow. And you really want to try to not drop the screws either into the motherboard. There is the CMOS battery here that retains settings and things, um, you know, once you set up the BIOS. And so what will happen is this could you know, cause a short because this has current, you know, running through parts of this board. Now notice we're not going to connect anything, power supply or fans or any other components until we get this board fully installed. The way they do this back one here is a little tough to line up because of this plastic. So we got, I think, two more to go. And I think our last one is up here by our CPU power connectors. And I still managed to miss some plastic. This always happens just because they put so much on these boards to try to keep them nice and clean looking. Okay, so now you can see the board's not moving at all, but that's okay. It allowed it to move so that each screw was able to line up. Oh, I did miss one. So we're going to add that one. 
So again, three on each row, at least on this motherboard. I've definitely seen a lot of micro, this is an ATX, uh, I've seen micro ATX motherboards typically don't have this row, and then the ITX motherboards are tiny, they only do like four screws. Sometimes there'll be that screw right there as well, uh, but this board doesn't have it. So you can see everything's lined up, so we're just going to tighten our screws, and we're going finger tight. If, if you've got your hand like this on the screwdriver, you're probably overdoing it. You really just want to be fingertip tight like this because you want it to be tight enough, but not so tight that you get the screws stuck in those standoffs. So if you ever need to pull them out, the standoffs don't come with the screw because that's not a good day. What you'd end up having to do is take the whole motherboard out, have the standoff still hanging off the back, and then use a socket or something to try to get it off. If you don't have a socket, you know, that fits these, that's okay. You could use pliers like needle nose or um, something like that. However, you know, I don't recommend that if you can avoid it just because it does mar up the standoffs and, you know, it could round them off too. I'm just going back through, making sure I got all of these guys nice and snug, but not over tight, just to make sure we're good to go. And I'm just going to check the board, make sure it's sitting, you know, well and everything is good. Let's go over some of our components on the board here. These are gonna be your SATA ports for those you know, larger and old school style drives. This is a USB 3.0 interface. This is the USB 3.1 or 3.2, depending on the board. Um, this is mainly for type C. These still use type A and you can get adapters to go from one to the other for front panel. This is your main power connector. This is a 24 pin motherboard power connector, but you'll see there are other power connectors up here and these are for your CPU. A CPU like this one needs this eight pin. Some of the older ones in less high wattage are just a four pin. And then there are fan headers. Uh, this one is for the main CPU fan. And then there's writing to tell you what each one does. Uh, there's gonna be one that's uh, an optional and there's going to be one that's for if you're doing water cooling and I'm not sure which I'd have to look in the manual. This is a chassis fan header and there's usually a couple of those around here. You've got your uh, front panel audio. There's actually still a serial port header on here which is kind of crazy and then on a lot of these more gaming style boards there will be RGB connectors. This one has a Thunderbolt header, which is a newer thing that's not on a lot of boards, old USB 2.0s, and then this is your front panel connector. The minimum you need to get this guy to turn on is the motherboard connector, a power connector for the CPU, and the front panel connectors here so that the power button on the case turns on the computer. You can get away with just connecting those and the CPU cooler uh, because the most motherboards are going to monitor that the CPU has a fan connected to it and that way uh, you know it doesn't go into thermal protection or anything like that. So those are the minimum things you need but I do recommend connecting everything that your case supports. If your case doesn't support like the type C, this one doesn't, you can actually get a five and a quarter bay uh, component that would get installed from the front, run a cable and have that USB type C. The other thing with the M2s that are under here is one of them at least shares some bandwidth with the SATA ports. And so you'll see in the manual on this ASUS that they have uh, mentioned that if you use one of these in SATA mode that it turns off a couple of these ports as well. Now let's look at getting that CPU installed and then the cooler as well. Next we're going to install the Cooler Master CPU cooler. It comes with some instructions here and this one works on tons of different Intel and AMD platforms. Uh, you just want to find the socket type you're using and then use the guide as to what standoffs to use in the bracket. I've done this one many times and I'm pretty familiar with it. The main thing that you want to look at is these three holes need to go over the three screws that are sticking out of the underside of the motherboard. If you were to do it upside down, on this one I don't think they stick out enough for it to matter, but some of these stick out far enough that it would actually bump it and this wouldn't line up properly. These are the standoffs for the front side for the inside of the case. It's going to be a nut or a, a bolt that has a hole in it for a screw. That's what the bracket that holds the CPU cooler is going to do. And it has a little plastic part that isolates it a little bit. 
then there's nuts that go on the back to connect to these bolts. I love that Cooler Master assumes you don't have a socket for that. You do have to put these together in little plastic things. So they give you a Phillips head little socket adapter. So the way it works, at least with this model, is you want to put the standoff through on the inside, and then on this side it lines up and has a little notch for which location. There's three depending on which CPU you're using. Then you're going to put the nut on and that's what's going to hold it all together. And again, just like with the case or with the uh, motherboard installation, you really want to make sure that you get these lined up properly. So I really recommend doing them very loose at first and then you can tighten them all down once everything's lined up. This is a little awkward since it's a little far away from me, but I really want you all to get to see inside and outside what's happening right now. So we're just going to start all four and then we'll tighten it down. Now you may have a completely you know different style of cooler. It might work you know using uh, the holes in the motherboard. A lot of the cheaper ones it's plastic and they use the holes in the motherboard that can be really difficult to get lined up and get to lock properly and that's just another reason why I like this style better. Uh, now we've got the little socket adapter that turns it into a Phillips head so we're going to put that on each nut, tighten it down and we'll just do that for each one and that way that way we can get them all snug again you don't want to go crazy um, you know over tightening is never good this is a printed circuit board and so because of that you could certainly damage something if you're not careful and if you go too hard so this bracket is now on you can see where the holes are lining up with the screws that are hanging through the board from the socket and it's on there nice and snug but not crazy tight so now we can lay the case down and get the CPU cooler you know, ready. We're going to unclip the big fan apparatus from this one first. There is a protective film over the thermal surface area. We're not going to touch that or take that off yet. And then we're going to set the fan assembly aside for right now. Now we're going to install the CPU. First you need to remove this cover that covers up all the pins. Old CPUs have pins hanging out of the bottom, and these newer ones are usually flat on the bottom and the pins are in the socket. Now, that could vary based on the CPU manufacturer and model. That said, you really want to be careful to not touch any of these pins, because if you did, you could bend them. And if you bend one of those pins, then you pretty much killed the motherboard. Those pins are spring-loaded, and they're going to contact the bottom of the CPU. And each of these little dots represents a, con a conductor that needs to talk to the motherboard. So we're going to leave it in this plastic case until we're ready to go. First we're going to pull back this arm and that's going to release pressure and then allow us to lift it up. Again, we're not going to touch any of this. Next, we're going to open up the CPU container and there's little holes on the sides for your fingers to fit so you can get it in or get it out. Now if you look at the bottom, you'll see there are notches on each side just two right there, at least on this Intel. And there are notches on each side of the socket right here. So we're just going to set that directly in. We're not going to slide it around or try to move it at all, but just make sure that those are sitting correctly in these notches. Again, you don't want to really touch the top if you can avoid it. Once you're sure this is in there correctly, you want to set this down, but make sure that it goes underneath here so that it locks in, and then you'll push down the armature. If you have this improperly seated at this step, you are going to damage something. Uh, there's no two ways about it. You can see there was a hair on there, so I had to pick it up and I already smudged the top, even though I was trying really hard not to. So I'm going to push this down. It is pretty firm and it is spring loaded, so you'll feel that you know it's going to spring back up at you. I'm going to push it out and let it kind of slide under, and now that CPU is installed. Again, if you're in any way you know, worried about this or concerned that you're not doing it right, I would stop and just have somebody help that does know what they're doing. Next, we're going to take the bracket that's going to hold our heat sink down and just make sure that all the screws line up with the holes that they're going to sit down into. You don't want to get the thermal paste on there and have to start moving things around or you're going to smudge it and get it everywhere. That lined up fine. I did have to move these little spring-loaded guys into the middle position per the instructions. We're going to take the film off of the bottom of the heat pipes here 
and we're not going to touch that surface if we can avoid it. If you don't have any thermal purifier like I have, you can also use some rubbing alcohol. You just want to be super careful. I would never put it on the CPU directly. I would always take a shop towel. I like to tear them in half just so they're a little bit smaller. And I'm going to put some of this thermal uh, pure surface purifier on here. Pretty generous amount. And then I'm just going to take that corner and rub it all over the surface of the CPU to make sure we get any oils off from my fingers for manufacturing, shipping, packaging, etc. And when I'm convinced that I've got it all off, we're just going to let it air dry. We're also going to do the same thing on the bottom of the heat sink where the heat pipes are. Just make sure it's going to be nice and clean. If this comes back and it's discolored more than just from being moist, then you might have some thermal paste on there if you're doing a clean to replace thermal paste. But of course, this is a brand new install, so there should be nothing on there. If there's any residue, you could go back over it with the dry side of your towel as well, just to be sure. Now notice I didn't get any dust from this paper towel in there because it's not a regular paper towel, it's a shop towel. If you use a regular paper towel, you'll probably end up getting little pieces of it in there, and that's going to be a pain to clean. Next, we're going to do thermal paste. This is a very controversial thing. Everybody kind of has their own method for doing this. I'm old school, so I do it the way I was trained almost 20 years ago. So I'm going to take off the lid, and I'm going to put a pea-sized spot right in the middle here. Now some people take like a spudger or you know a toothpick or something like that and they spread it all around using a toothpick or a spudger in order to make sure it gets all the nooks and crannies. I trust that it's going to squeeze out correctly once I put all this together. But a lot of that is going to be based on making sure I don't slide this all around. If you put too much on there and it gets it all around here, that could cause a short and that could damage your motherboard and that could cause a problem down the road. Also, when you go to do this again, when you take it off, you might see that you overdid it the last time. This one collapses, so I'm going to collapse it, put it through. And then it lines up with a little stud in the middle, and then there's a stud on the right as well. So we're just going to put all this together and make sure that it's all sitting correct. This Cooler Master is unique. Not all of them are going to work this way. I'm going to be really careful and try to set it down. I'm going to start my first screw. And you want to get at least a couple of turns on it just so it doesn't move on you. Now I'm going to go for the opposite corner. And I'm going to get a couple of turns on it. Then I'm going to do another corner. And then the last one that's standing up. This one I'm going to have to put on some force because all this stuff is spring-loaded because it's trying to get it to make the best possible connection as far as being completely flush with the top of that CPU. So now I'm going to go back to the first one and do a couple of turns, then the opposing in a couple of turns, and you'll see I'm just going to do this over and over again until it's snugged up. And that way I'm sure that that thermal paste is spreading in every direction pretty evenly throughout the process of doing this. Now if you get to one, you know, the last one takes 15 more turns than the first one, then you're probably overdoing it a little, but hopefully you don't have to worry too much about it. What you can do if you're at all concerned that you didn't get the thermal paste spread properly is you could take this back off and look. And on my first, you know, several builds, that's what I did, just to be sure I was doing this correctly, since the thermal paste is so important in getting your CPU cool, uh, because it helps transmit the heat from the top of that CPU uh, into the heat sink, and then the fan blows across the heat sink to pull that heat out of the heat sink. Now this is a really large cooler, and this will not fit in a lot of cases. Uh, this case is pretty large and it's pretty wide, so that's what's going to allow it to fit. You can see all of them are pretty much snug now. As always, I'm just going to do a once over again just to make sure I didn't miss anything and that everything is nice and snug. Now, depending on use and overclocking and things like that, this thermal paste should last for years.
That said, you know, if you start getting high temps or something like that, you may need to replace it sooner rather than later. That's also why you want to use a higher quality thermal paste, is it's going to last longer and it's going to be in better shape. These fins are going to be very flexible because they're aluminum. So if you bend a few or anything, don't worry that much about it. You can just take a finger and straighten them out, or you can take a flathead screwdriver and lift them up. You'll see there is a little play in this still, and that's because this whole apparatus is kind of floating with a spring-loaded uh, bracket to hold it down. Next, you know, we want to install that fan, but if you go ahead and do the fan, you're not going to be able to get to the memory slots very easily, so I recommend doing the RAM first. Also, we need to get RM2 installed. Next, we're going to unbox the M2 drive. You can see this is that nice Samsung 980 Pro. It is just a little card, and it's going to go into one of these slots. There are three M2 slots, actually. There's a middle one here that I forgot to mention earlier. Now, as far as which of the three you use, again, you want to refer to the motherboard's manual. In this one, you can see the M2 slots allow you to install M2 SSD modules, the 11th gen processors. It tells you which slot supports what mode. So a lot of them are 3.0 X4s, only one of them is a 4.0 X4. And then it doesn't look like that one does SATA mode, but the other two do. So it says the M.2 underscore one supports PCIe 4.0 X4, which is the fastest. That's this top socket A, M2 underscore 1 is A, which is this top socket. So we're going to take off these screws from this heat spreader. I believe they're retained in the heat spreader. I don't think they come out. Yes. You can see even on the spreader it says that this one is PCIe 4.0. Now if you look at the underside, this has a thermal pad on it, and you want to remove this protective cover. Now, you don't want to touch on this any more than you have to, and it will lift up off this aluminum, so you want to be careful. You can also see where it got a little squished by the bracketry in here. I'm going to set that aside. So this is our slot. Different motherboards retain the M2 drive different ways. Older ASUS boards, you had to put a standoff, a lot like the motherboard standoffs, in a hole, and then it had a screw. This style uses these little plastic clips, which is a lot easier, and there's nothing to get lost, which is nice as well. There's a key right here, the little notch, that tells you which way it goes. It should be all the way back. You may have to wiggle a little and then push down. I've got to move this little bracket up out of the way so that I can get it on there, and then this locks it in and now it's nice and snug. And that's really it. You could take the label off here to get better thermal connectivity to this heat spreader if you want to, because this label here is actually going to insulate the drive. The problem is that could void the warranty of the drive depending on the manufacturer. Then we're going to put this back on by lining up the screws with the little standoffs that are on the motherboard. There's one. And the other. Now this will also fit here, and this one can be moved up to here. They only give you two spreaders for three drives, though, which is kind of weird. But it's neat that this motherboard will support three M2 drives, because you could have one running your operating system, and then a couple of them could be for data storage. Again, we're just going to go snug on these screws, nothing crazy, not a huge amount of torque. Next, we're going to do the RAM modules. Again, we're going to refer back to the motherboard's manual, and it should have some information in here about which RAM slots do what. For the DIMM slots, you can see they're A1, A2, B1, and B2. Recommended memory configuration is important. If you have just one stick, it goes in A2, which is this lighter gray slot here. If you have two, they go in A2 and B2, which is the two light gray slots. Three, I would probably add it here, it doesn't specify, so the light grays plus this one. And then four, obviously all four. This is important because this has multiple channels, and that's really what the magic word is about how this works, is channels. So the reason why this is the recommended configuration is, if you have one, it doesn't even really matter, but they recommend it in A2, and I would do that. 
For two sticks to run in what's called dual channel mode, meaning a controller for each stick, it has to be in the light gray slots for your two sticks. The downside of going with four sticks is that now you've got two modules per controller, so you're not really in full dual channel speed anymore. And you can see dual inline memory modules is what DIMM stands for. This is DDR4, and so I am going to do A2 and B2 since we have two modules. Got this Corsair Vengeance. We're just going to pop it out of the package. And much like with our motherboard, there's going to be some film over top of the logos and stuff here that kind of drives me nuts. So we're going to take that off of each module. I don't think there's any over the words, no, just over the, or the label rather, just over the name, since it's so important that it's vengeance. Now notice these are short, these don't have giant heat sinks on them, and that's so I can be sure and clear that fan that goes on here. You could get them that are really tall and do four and have one all the way back here, and then the heat sinks fan won't go on. Now some heat sinks the fan goes this way instead of this way, and that avoids it. Notice there's a notch, and you want to be sure which way it goes. If you did it this way, that's incorrect. This way is correct. Again, we're going the light gray slots. You've got to pop these guys back and then set it down in there. Now, some motherboards and all older motherboards, both sides flipped out, not just one. But on a lot of these newer DDR4s, one side moves and the other doesn't. I'm going to take two fingers, push down on the side that doesn't move till it clicks, and then push down on the side that does move till it clicks as well. And that should bring up this part when you push down. There's a little foot in there that gets pushed down by the stick so that this pops forward. You can also help it a little, but you want to be sure it's fully seated. And I get computers in pretty often uh, at our place of business that other people have built that didn't get these fully seated. And they'll be like kind of loosey-goosey in there, not even locked in there, even facing the wrong direction, and none of that's a good idea. Now, first time I saw a DDR4 like this, I thought it was broken. You can see it actually bumps out and then back in. This is actually by design. The reason they do this is to put less stress on the parts while you're putting it in there. So we're going to go in the other light gray slot. We've got to move that out of the way again. And we're going to get it lined up, push it down in there. And then again, we're going to go with the side that doesn't move till it clicks, and then the side that does. And then it clicks in. If you feel like you're having to push too hard to the point that you're bending the whole motherboard, something's probably not right. You need to kind of reset, take a breath, look at it, analyze the situation, and then move forward. Now these are installed, everything's good. I'm going to tug on them, make sure I got them in there. These do have heat spreaders on them. Some DIMMs won't. They'll just be a bare uh, circuit board, and then you'll see the silicone on there for each memory uh, component. And these, the heat spreaders help, you know, thermal connectivity again. Next, we're going to install the CPU coolers fan. Now, a couple of tips about fans. The most cases are going to pull air in the front and exhaust it out the back, top, and or side. Now, the way you can tell which way a fan blows is this flat part. The part that moves is always the intake side. The flat part where the bracketry is is always the output of the fan. So all the internal fans on the front here are facing in to blow air in, because this is the flat side. On the back, it's the spinning side, so you know air is going that way. Same deal with this. So the last thing you'd want to do is mount it this way to where it's pulling air and blowing it the wrong direction. So we want air to go this way. Also, they put some tags on here that kind of drive me crazy, saying that the warranty void if removed for this serial number, which is insane because it's a fan, um, and that's going to be in your way. And then this is basically a tag telling you that it's not trash, which is kind of silly. What they really mean is that this is not safe to be disposed of in the landfill. This needs to be recycled as electronics. Now, as far as how this one lines up, this is going to clip on here. I removed it myself so I know how it goes on there. Cooler Master also included a second set of these brackets so you could do another fan on the other side to help pull air out as well. This cable is going to be connected to the motherboard down here. This is a four pin fan connector. Uh, basically, the main components of it are gonna be positive and negative electricity. 
and then there's going to be a speed sensor wire, and then there's going to be what's called a PWM wire. The PWM wire is what allows it to be controlled by the motherboard. That way it's not spinning at full speed all the time. This PWM wire is going to allow it to throttle the CPU fan up and down as needed to conserve energy and make less noise. You can see this is a 12 volt fan, and 12 volt is very common for fans. Most of them are 12 volt. Now, if I go ahead and install this, it's going to be really hard to tie up this wire. So I just know from experience that I can go ahead and tie this wire up a little bit in order to keep it out of my way. And if I tie it up now, it's going to be a lot easier to cable manage than later. So I'm just going to take this wire, kind of flatten it out a little bit like this, take some 4-inch zip ties, and tighten those around it. You don't want to hunker down on it so hard that you're going to damage the wire. But that said, you don't want it to come loose either. You could do it in a circle or in linear like I'm doing. Now, again, I've done this more times than I could possibly count, so it's pretty easy for me and I already kind of know the length. If you're unsure of the length, kind of loosely install the fan, plug in the fan connector, and fold the cable to where this side and this side are touching, and that'll tell you how long to make this gap. Then you can take it back out and wind it up as neat as possible and then put it together. We're going to use our flush cutter so that we don't have too much hanging out. I'm going to pull on the tie while I cut it. If you flush cut them well, there's really nothing hanging out and it's nice. I'm going to go ahead and plug this in first since I'm not going to have a lot of room to do that later. Now again, I know this first one is for the CPU cooler and we can look in the manual to show that as well. This just kind of clips on to this heat sink. Again, different fans are going to connect different ways. Some face, you know, downward to push air through a heat sink. Some face upward to pull air out. Uh, but suffice it to say, all of them are going to use the main CPU fan header. If you were to not use that fan header, you're going to make the motherboard freak out because it's not going to uh, test or sense that there's a fan there. So if you look in the motherboard, there's CPU fan is that first one, then optional, then an all-in-one pump, that'd be for water cooling. That you'll also see that there are other chassis fan connectors as well. There's one, there's a different type of fan connector, uh, there's another chassis fan and another water pump, another chassis fan. So there's tons of headers on this thing, which is nice. Notice there's actually a power switch on the motherboard too, which is cool for testing purposes. There's also an LED that'll light up if you turn it on using this button. Not a lot of motherboards have that. Again, something I love about ASUS. They kind of think of everything because they've been doing this longer than anybody. And they make a lot of the motherboards for a lot of major manufacturers too, which is cool. So we're going to make sure this is on there correctly. It's lined up well and nice and snug. It's plugged into our motherboard, so that's good to go. Our next step is going to be power supply. Here are all the components that came with our power supply. There are generally three types of power supplies that you're going to see in the aftermarket like this. There are fully modular, which means no cables are connected to this power supply out of the box. There's semi-modular, where it's usually the main motherboard connector and the CPU connector, and maybe one more are on here, and then there's ports for the other peripherals and uh, uh, SATA cables, Molex cables, things like that. And then they're just completely non-modular, where you've got this whole bulk of squid just hanging out of your power supply. I'm going to show you each connector and kind of what it does. Now, different power supplies, even from the same manufacturer, are going to be different. And if you have multiple computers, I really recommend keeping track of all these cables, keeping them together, labeling them as to which make and model it came with, because just because it physically connects doesn't mean it's the right cable. And one thing that drives me nuts being a guy that makes his own cables sometimes is these that are all black. Normally on a motherboard connector, all of these are a different color, or at least on uh, older style power supplies, non-gaming style power supplies, they're all a different color because that indicates what it does. Them all being black kind of restricts you to having to look at where they are in the connector to know what they do, and that kind of scares me. Um, for our build, we're going to need the main motherboard connector. We're going to need the 8-pin CPU connector. Um, this one actually comes with two of them, which is really cool, because this would support a motherboard that needs that much power and or has multiple CPUs, uh, which is unlikely these days. 
We're not going to use this. This is an old Molex to floppy style adapter. Almost never going to see those in use anymore. Though some card readers and front USB hubs use that. This is an old connector called a Molex. These aren't going to be on many devices anymore, but you'll see these for fans. You'll see this old floppy adapter goes to it. Uh, see old CD drives used these as well, and old hard drives for that matter did as well. And then we've got some SATA cables. These are just regular SATA power connectors. And these are right angle style, which is cool. They're low profile. So those we won't need either since we're not doing any SATA drives in our build. So we'll set those off to the side. We will use the Molex connector because this case the fans are powered that way and there's some lights on it that are powered with that that we're not going to connect the lights long term. And then these two are going to be super important for our video card. These are EVGA VGA connectors. So these are going to go to your PCI Express video Video card. Now these support uh, just a regular 6-pin or an 8-pin and you can see there's actually two 8-pins two on each one. So this does from the power supply to a dual 8-pin max and then this does from the power supply to another dual 8-pin. Could be dual 6-pin, could be single 6-pin, could be single 8-pin. So you've got plenty of flexibility with all this stuff. Now you could install the power supply in the case and then put in the connectors. This case has the power supply area isolated for uh, heat and thermal conductivity. So because of that, it's a little harder to get to. Um, so we'll go ahead and do some of these connectors first. So this motherboard connector, you can see it's labeled MB for motherboard. We're going to put that in. Why they split it into two connectors, I don't know. And why it's not just this connector on both ends, I just don't know. As far as the CPU, we know that we're going to do a single CPU. This end that's not split is the one we're going to connect. The split end would be a 4 or 8 pin for the motherboard CPU connector. Lastly, there's going to be a, a, a peripheral connection for this Molex. This is going to give us our fan power, so we are going to need that as well. Now, this power supply does come with the power cord to the wall. It comes with some cable management straps. There's an instruction manual, and then this guy. This is pretty confusing to most people that don't know what it's for. Uh, this can be used for multiple things. Oh, it did come with four screws, which are black to mount it. This shorts two pins. So if you take your motherboard connector and you put this on there, the moment you hook that on, if there's power applied, it's going to turn it on. That's cool because you can leave that connected, and then you can use the power switch here on the back to turn on and off the whole power supply. Now, for our purposes and for most people's purposes, using this inside a computer, this has no purpose and would not allow you to connect your motherboard. For people that do crypto mining, however, this forces the power supply to turn on, and then you'll get power out of all these other connections that you can use for other things. But we're going to leave this off for now. So let's get the power supply installed into the case, and then we'll look at getting it all connected. On this case, the power supply is going to go in this bottom section. Some cases it's in the top. Some you just slide it in from the side or the top and then you put screws in. This one is a little more modular than that, so it's got a little bracket that comes off the back that you connect the power supply to when you put it in. So we move all these other connectors out of the way first. Notice there are vents at the bottom and it's opaque at the top or sealed at the top. So you wouldn't want to put it with the fan facing upward because then the fan's got nowhere to pull air from or blow air out of. So in this one, we're going to have the fan facing down. So we're going to align it that way. So we're going to take our rear bracket and see where that's going to line up. Now we can use thumb screws that came with the case or we can use the Phillips head screws that came with the power supply. They're all the coarse thread, so it doesn't really matter which ones we choose, either of them will work. So I'm just going to get these guys started. I like using the thumb screws just because to me it makes the most sense. You've already got thumb screws for the sides hanging out of the back, as well as for this bracket hanging out. Again, I'm going to go with them kind of loose because at the end of the day, this needs to be able to move around because I don't know how much play it's got. And again, I went ahead and connected all this stuff. So I'm going to send it through here. And then we, there are little rubber feet to isolate the power supply when you put it in here. Again, that's because this is a very quiet style case. So we're going to slide the power supply in. And then once that lines up, 
I'm going to mount the bracket that holds the power supply first. So we're going to get those screws started. Now you could use a screwdriver on these thumb screws, but it's unnecessary, I think. And we're going to tighten the four screws that actually hold the power supply in. So now the power supply is mounted. And if you look underneath, this case has a uh, mesh filter down here so that if this is pulling air in, then that filters that air coming in. And this one, I think it's actually blowing air out, so it's less functional, but still a cool design. Now we need to get all of the power supply connectors connected, as well as all of these case connectors. Now it's a little unwieldy right now. You can see all these are kind of hanging out everywhere. So we're just going to start at kind of the, the easiest first, um, or I guess this is actually the hardest, is the CPU. Now we're going to use the 8-pin CPU connector, and I love this case because it's got a nice spot to pass it through because it's right here on the other side of the motherboard. So we're going to pass that through here and then I'll show you how it connects on the inside. Then we're going to take the main motherboard connector, which I'm going to pass through this top hole because that's the closest to where it's going to end up. Lastly is this Molex, which will go on these fans. We can wait on that until the end. Let's start with connecting the motherboard power. This is the 24 pin, and you can see there's a clip on this side, and there's a spot for the clip to latch on the actual motherboard connector. Now, a lot of times I see people run these on this side of the case, which is okay, but it can get in the way, and this case is designed for it to be run over the back. I also like that it kind of flips over, and that way it's nice and tidy. Now, if you just push this down, you could bend the motherboard. So I really like to reach in, get some fingers under the motherboard, and kind of wiggle it back and forth till that clip goes on. I get these in all the time that people did not fully seat it, and that clip's not all the way on. Next let's look at Next let's look at the CPU power connector. Now again, each motherboard is going to be a little different. So you want to refer to the manual. They don't give you a paper manual like this one, then you'll have to do it online or something like that. As far as the, these power connectors, there's a section that talks about them. So let's take a look. You can see it's number 6 power connectors. That's page 11 or 1.11. All right, so you can see these power connectors allow you to connect your motherboard to a power supply. So that's the main one we did, and then A and B. As far as A and B, it says, for a fully configured system, we recommend you use a power supply unit that comes with an ATX 12.0 specification, 2.0 or later, and 350 watts minimum. It doesn't really say anything about those power connectors. However, I can tell you from experience that you can run just a 4-pin, but you get a lot less wattage. So if you have an 8-pin on the motherboard, you do want to use that. As far as using both an 8-pin and a 4-pin at the same time, that should never be necessary unless you're pulling an insane amount of wattage through the board itself. Now this is a 4-pin or 8-pin, so they're a little flexible and that makes them more unwieldy. We do want them to go on here, and again the clips go on the side where there's a little clip there. This can get a little tight, and if you've got big hands, it can be hard to get in here to do it. So you want to line them up so that they both go in simultaneously, and then again, just kind of rock them back and forth, make sure the clips are on, and give it a little tug and make sure that it's in there. Again, I like this case a lot because this allows us to pass it through from the back, so that way it's not hanging across, can't get stuck in a fan, or cause any other issues. So now our 8-pin is on there. Technically speaking, you could fire up the computer at this point. You have a power supply, motherboard with a CPU and RAM, and power. However, you would have to have integrated graphics for the graphic connectors on the motherboard to work. Just because there's graphic connectors on this back panel doesn't mean your CPU supports integrated graphics, and a lot of them these days don't. So for our build, we want to have our graphics card installed as well. Um, so we're going to do that next, and that's going to require power of its own too. This is our ASUS RTX 3060 GeForce graphics card. You can see it comes with a bunch of plastic on it as well, and I do see these all the time that people install without taking this plastic off. That's really not good for a number of reasons. 
The biggest one is, this is aluminum, at least on this model, so that's acting as a heat sink, and you don't want to hold heat in by leaving plastic on there. So we want to get every bit of this plastic off. Now, why ASUS finds it necessary to put plastic literally on the center spindle of each fan as well, I will never understand other than they're afraid you're gonna scratch something during shipping or packaging or something, and it just makes it that much more tedious for you to have to take all this stuff off. And again, a lot of people just don't notice it, so they forget to do it, and that can get pretty annoying. So as far as this card, you've got main connectors for the output on the back here. They put little dummies in them just to protect them, and I do like that. There's also a little plastic dummy over the actual interface. I've seen people not take this off and try to put the card in and damage the motherboard or card or both. You don't want to touch these gold contacts either. That's going to be data and some power going through those later. Also, there's plastic on this back panel, which again is aluminum in this case, so I think it's going to act as a heat sink in some way. This one is very difficult to get off too. There we go. And then you've got a single 8-pin power connector on this model. Now, some may have no power connector, like the old GTX 1050s didn't. Um, there's a lot of little baby cards, like the 730 GT, that don't need power. They're getting all their power through the motherboard. But these higher-end graphics cards are often going to have a 6-pin, or an 8-pin, or dual 6, or dual 8-pins right on the card. And if you were to not connect to this and fire up the computer, it's not going to have enough power. Now, that said, there are cards that will go into protection mode if you don't, you know, connect to that. And there are cards that won't, and they'll try to pull that power through the motherboard, and you'll start blowing items up. So pay a lot of attention. Sometimes that connector is going to be on the top. Sometimes it's going to be on the back. Depends on the card. This card has three really large fans on it, and so this is probably why it, it needs a lot of power. Also, the GPU that's on here needs power too. So we're going to get this card installed, get the 8-pin power connector on there, and then we're going to be able to fire up this computer after doing the front panel I.O. connectors. Or we could use that cute power button on the motherboard. So on most motherboards, the top slot is where you're going to want to put the video card. Again, we can refer to the manual, and that will give us some information. This one has PCIe x16 underscore 1. You can see in this column, that means it runs in x16 mode. If you put in multiple cards, though, that one immediately drops to only x8 mode. And that's a big deal, because that's your graphics bandwidth. So ideally, you don't want to populate any of the other x16 slots, because clearly they share bandwidth. 8, 4, and 4 is 16. So the moment you plug in another one, you're robbing from your main video card connector. Now, we have to take these rear I.O. covers off in order to fit the card. Now, different cards align different ways. So if we look at lining this up, we can see if this were to go in the slot, the first white one and second black one are going to be the two that this card can line up with. So we're going to take those screws out. These are almost always the coarse screws. I don't know that I've ever seen these be fine thread screws. And again, if you can keep from letting any of this stuff touch the motherboard, you want to because these could short something. Then we're going to keep those screws because that's what's going to hold the video card down. There is a little flipper here that holds the video card. You want to make sure that's back a lot like with the RAM. Now you're going to take the card, you're going to line it up with the holes in the slots for the back and with the slot on the board. You do want to make sure that it sits down into that slot and then you want to push down and that foot should pop up when that makes good contact there and this should be in there. Now we can put the screws back in. Now you could damage something if you don't have that properly aligned when you go to put that card in. Also this is a pretty big and heavy card. In some cases uh, have brackets on the back to help support the card. So it'll actually be something here coming across the back to the front of the case, allowing it to you know, help with this weight because these cards can get really heavy. Like an RTX 3090, for instance, is going to be extremely heavy. Anything with a lot of metal and a bunch of fans is going to be really heavy too. Now notice my screwdriver's at a slight angle. I'm trying to not 
you know, round any of these off. And I'm still just going finger tight. Then I want to make sure that card is well seated. Now we need to get our power connected. Now I could have run this already, you know, from the back. That's the CPU one. You want to make sure, at least with these, it's the one that says VGA. And you'll notice I only have a single 8-pin, but both of mine are going to be dual 8-pin. So I'm going to use the first connector, and that's going to help me do wire management a little bit nicer later. We do need to make sure that all 8-pins line up. This one has little notches that you can push this together with. So you want to make sure that's done. And then we're going to put that into the connector here, and we're going to push down and lock it in. Now this needs to be routed back to the rear of the case again so that it can go into the power supply. So we're going to slide that through one of these poles. And that way we can reach it from the back. So now we can reach the back of the case and pull this cable through. We want to make sure that it's not hanging up on anything on the inside. And that we're not pulling too hard on the video card either. So this one we're going to route from this side of the motherboard connector and then down to the bottom. Now again, this would have been a lot easier to connect before because now I've got to reach in here, be able to see where it goes. Probably need a little bit of light that I don't have. Oh, luckily it's right here, these very first ports, so I can see them just fine. All right, let's see if we can line it up where you can see it. So you can see... You can see inside here is our power supply, VGA 1 and 2. So we're going to go into VGA 1. I believe we could go in VGA 2. I don't really think it matters. Our next order of business are going to be the front panel connectors. You can see a hard drive LED light, a reset switch, and a power switch. All of these are going to need to route from the front of the case around the back, at least on this model, and then they're going to need to go into the interior where we can plug them into the motherboard. Now this also has USB 3.0 and that's going to need to go to the front as well. And then there's also going to be an audio front panel connector and a USB front panel connector. This is USB 2.0 that is. And those are going to need to go into the interior of the case too. Now as far as how you route these, it depends on how you've done your cabling. I really want them to be under all the power connectors. So we're going to try to go under with all of that. And then we're going to take our Molex and we're going to go to this fan connector because this runs all of the fans. The reason the fans all run off one connector is because they've got these daisy chains in here. And that allows you to control all the fans on this case from the front. There's a little switch up there that does it. Again, I'm going to go to the first one on here so that I can cable manage this better. There's only two pins because it's just positive and negative and those need to go into here. If you look, these move around a lot depending on how the connector sits on the cable. So you may need to wiggle it and move it around to get it to clip in. That was rather easy, but a lot of times you've got to play with it. And if you push too hard, you'll pop these out and then you've damaged the connector. And there's ways of fixing it, but it's certainly not something you want to have to do. So all four fans are connected with this through these other cables. We'll clean all this up later. Our USB 3.0, audio and 2.0, and then our front panels are through here too. So we need to be on the other side of the case now. Let's do the USB 3.0. There's a little guy here and a notch there. And these are going to line up and you're going to push this connector down into the motherboard. Again, you don't want to push too hard, but it does need to fully seat. It doesn't really click and it's not the best connection, which kind of drives me nuts. Again, this is for a Type-C connector that we don't have. Over here, you can see the old USB 2.0 just says USB. And we have multiple spots where that fits. There's two here, and we're going to use just one of them. Notice there's a dead pin where it is not open, and there's a pin missing. That's how you line it up. For the rear uh, audio, it's the same, but the dead pin's in a different spot. And then in the rear audio connector here, the dead pin is in the middle of two right there. That's so your headphone jack and mic jack on the front work. 
This is for front panel USBs that are 2.0. This is for front panel USBs that are 3.0. The last main component to connect on the motherboard is going to be the front panel I.O. connectors. You can see that they are labeled with white lettering on this case. And then their connectors are down here. There's a guide printed on the motherboard, but it's excruciatingly hard to read. So we're going to look in the motherboard manual yet again in order to see which ones go where. So on this one, you can see the front panel connector, power LED, the hard drive LED, and reset switch are all on this guide. Fortunately, ASUS makes this a little easier than other manufacturers. They give you this little riser. So this is going to make it far easier than trying to get your hands in there and connect them onto the board directly. We're going to start with the hard drive LED because it has polarity. So it's got a plus and minus on it because it requires a certain polarity. Next, we're going to do the reset switch and we're going to keep the label facing the same way. And then on the back side is going to be our power switch, power SW here. This is ground and PWR. And I like facing them the same way as the other ones. You could face them out. There shouldn't be polarity since it's just a momentary switch. This has dead pins in it, so you can't really hook it up wrong. However, the weird part is there's two extra pins here on the end that this does not cover. So we're going to take this front panel I.O. connector and put it onto the board here. And that makes it nice and easy to plug in without having to have your hands crammed down there trying to get these tiny connectors onto the tiny connectors onto the board. So we've completed the build in a very basic way. There's still a lot of uh, wire cleanup and stuff that I want to do just to keep cables out of fans and to make it look better. But I like to go ahead and fire it up once I'm at this point so that I'm sure everything is functional and everything is working. I've connected a monitor to power and then an HDMI cable to the video card. Again, we're not using the graphics built into the motherboard on this one, so I've got it connected on the card. And again, not all CPUs have integrated graphics, especially a lot of the Radeon CPUs. So if you don't get display out of the motherboard connectors, that doesn't mean anything's wrong. That may just mean you need a video card. Uh, but we've got everything hooked up in the uh, standard or most basic way. I'm going to start by flipping on the power supply switch. You'll see the LEDs on the motherboard are RGB and they're starting to light up now. There is a power button on the motherboard, but we're going to use the case power button and hope that everything kicks on. Now all four system fans, the CPU fan, and the GPU fans have all turned on. It'll take a moment to show a display, so try not to freak out and be patient. It's good that everything turned on. Now we'll wait for the display to come up. The blue light came on, and there's our splash screen, and there's AMI BIOS. AMI has been making BIOS for a really long time, and this is going to give us a lot of good information. You've got the revision on here, the RAM total, which is 32 gigabytes, the Samsung SSD. They're letting us know that it's a brand new CPU installed, so it wants to be set up. It's got no keyboard because I haven't connected one yet, but this is enough to know that everything is up and running. You can also just do a cursory look to make sure everything looks like it's doing what it's supposed to as far as lights, fans, etc. Now we would like to power this down from here. A single press on the main power button will turn it off, and then we can do our cable management. So the idea is to clean all this up to where the side will go on neatly and nicely without crushing everything, but also so that none of the cables get pinched, crushed, or sucked into fans, especially when you're moving the case around, because inevitably you're probably going to have to turn it over. You may end up moving and need to move it. So I've got four and eight inch zip ties here, and I'm going to use mainly four inch ties. Our CPU power connector is up here, so I would like to tie it to the back of the case. I'm going to feed a zip tie through. And then I'm going to loosely just kind of get it connected. And then I'm going to figure out the path of all these ties before I start hunkering things down. Cable management is one of my favorite parts. I'm sure a lot of people find it tedious, but I enjoy doing it. And it's certainly important from a functionality standpoint because the less wad of cables you have, the better airflow is going to be and things like that. So once I've got them kind of situated where I want, I'm going to go ahead and pull it you know, snug, not tight. And I want to make sure I'm not pulling too hard on the inside. And then I'm going to tighten the tie. And I'm going to continue to do that all the way down. 
Now I'd like to get this tied up a little bit better and I can tie up these front panel I.O. connectors using this next one. I really like on these Antec cases they give you plenty of places to put ties. It does come with some ties but they're a little weak to be honest. I really like you know aftermarket ones that you get at the big box stores unfortunately better and that way they don't break as easily because cheap ties do break kind of easily. Next we're going to deal with the larger cables. They have built-in Velcro for a lot of this stuff. I like the way Antec routes a lot of it, but right here is kind of a pinch point that concerns me. So I'm going to go ahead and throw a tie around the case up there. You can see it. there's a way to pass through here. So I'm just going to reach through and tie these cables up so that they can't go anywhere up here. Again, I'm going to leave it kind of loose till I figure out where everything's going to go. These Velcro ones are fine too, so you can just kind of wrap those around and then if there's excess you can leave it, you can cut it. I don't really see a point in these flags so I usually cut them off. And then once I'm happy with it, I can tighten down the ties. And see now it's not hitting this corner in a funny way and wanting to hang out. There's twist ties on a lot of these fans from the factory, and so I'm going to take those off and then I'm going to route all these cables in the neatest way I can. Again, I'm just trying to maximize airflow, make it look nice because it's just nice for the inside of your case to look nice. And then also, you know, to keep anything from getting damaged when you put the side on. Also, the more you can tie from the back this way, the less you're going to see from the front. And on a lot of the fancy gaming cases, they have clear side panels, so that is certainly a consideration. Now these fans are all pre-wired, but I'm not 100% on how they do it. I don't really like the kinks they put into these wires, so I try to flatten as much of that out as I can, and then I try to tie them to where you don't see them using what's left of these hard drive rails. There's plenty of holes though, and then they do include you know, plenty of pieces as well in order to tie you know, things down like this. I always use my flush cutters so I don't end up cut up with what's left of the ties. Anything you've got where you're only using one power connector like this, I just like to tie the rest together or I'll even bend one out of the way. So that way I can kind of minimize its footprint. You could also do it all linear like this to get it out of the way. This power connector is not labeled but I just know from experience with this case that there are lights on the front of the case. They're not power lights that connect to the motherboard in a traditional way. They light up when the power supply is powered up, and they're actually around the USB ports on the top here. They're pretty bright white LEDs, and I know where this is going to go in, in a business. They're not going to like that, so I'm just going to leave that disconnected, and it's not going to hurt anything. But that's pretty unique to this case. Most cases are going to have a power LED that connects to the motherboard, and it's just going to be like a green light or something like that, not a blaring white light like these have on the top. If there's ever any excess you know, wire down here, rather than just cramming it in the hole, I do like to tie it up nice and neat, just again to maximize the airflow as much as, much as I can. And then if there's a cable like this that I'm not going to use, I'm just going to try to get it out of the way as best I can. So I might even run this one back up using some of this Velcro. I'm also going to utilize the Velcro for this main motherboard power connector so that it's nice and out of the way. Now we're starting to generate a bit of a wad here, so that's what is going to preclude us from getting the side of the case on the best possible way. So you really want to try to make it as flat as you can if you want that case side to sit flat. Some sides slide and those are going to be exceedingly difficult if you don't get this wad kind of cleaned up because it's not going to want to push flat when you go to slide it on. Again, you can see where they kink some wires from the factory. I didn't do that, but it does frustrate me a bit that they do. Lastly, I'm going to take an 8 inch tie and I'm going to go through here in order to try to flatten all this stuff 
and move it out of view a little bit since I know all this white is opaque from the other side. So that way I'm trying to kind of squish it flat without crushing any cables as best I can. Now the last thing, I could put the side on, but I want to be sure where all these internal cables are going. And you can see I've got this VGA power cable that could use a little less slack. Also, it's got this secondary connector, so I'm just going to zip tie that together to get it up and out of the way. I don't like leaving anything to chance with this stuff because you got a system fan or a, a CPU fan right there that this could fall right into. Also, if you have cables here, they could fall into the rear exhaust fan. You can purchase fan grills that would cover part of this with mesh so that that would you know, help keep that from happening. Unfortunately, though, they're not included on almost anything anymore. And 120 millimeter, or that's 140, I think, is uh, not exactly a common size to get mesh for. Now that's out of the way. I believe it'll be okay with the side of the case. Actually, let's pull it a little bit tighter. I just don't want to put too much pull on the video card's power connector because that would be a really bad day if you damage the video card, especially with the lack of availability right now. That would really frustrate me. All right, so you can see we've got a little bit of a loop from that VGA power. There's not really enough to tie up, so I'm just going to tuck it in. And you can see everything's in pretty good shape now. Our case sides are the same on both sides for this case. That's not always going to be that way though, especially with the ones that have a clear panel that's going to go on the other side. This one just clips on, it doesn't slide, which I love. The ones that slide can be extremely tedious to put on. So I'm just going to get our thumb screws and I'm not going to use a screwdriver. That way I can get this back off without a screwdriver in the future if I need to. Our front panel opens up. It does have the mesh filter. You can take that out to blow it out. There's a five and a quarter bay if you did want to do a CD drive or one of those USB front panel, you know, uh, connectors that go in a five and a quarter bay. And then you can see from the inside, it's nice and clean. There's really no excess cables at all. There's a little bit of the front panel down here, but I can tuck that in if I want to and get it kind of out of the way. I could also pull that slack through. There's a little bit more slack I could pull through on these too, but I'm really happy with how it turned out. I really love the amount of airflow you get across here. That's really going to help cool this video card with all these front fans. And I think it looks nice. Uh, I get that the case is a lot bigger than I need it to be, but I need the depth in order to fit the big cooler and the big video card without putting pressure on this. And I really like just additional airflow where I can get it. We can put this side on as well. It goes on just like the other one. The front goes on first, and then it just clips on. And that's it. You've got a custom-built computer. Even after all these years, I really still enjoy building custom computers. It's one of my favorite things I do for my job. And I really find it relaxing because I'm so confident in it. I've done so many of them now that it's really not nerve wracking for me. But I get that for somebody new to it, it certainly is. I remember my first build, I think it was 1998 when I did it. Uh, I had a lot of questions, didn't know exactly what I was doing, relied on some friends in order to help me and kind of show me what to do. And I recommend that you do the same. Um, you know, your first time, it can certainly be daunting, but just make sure you take your time, take it slow, ask a lot of questions, seek out help if you need it, and then, you know, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised with how easy it can be. That said, better components make for a better build. You know, taking your time makes for a better build. Doing proper management of cables keeps things from getting pulled into fans and causing other problems. If you get everything assembled and it's not working, stop, take a breath, and find somebody that can help you. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the comments below. Please like, share, and subscribe. And if there's anything you want to add I didn't include, tips or tricks or different ways of doing things, put that in the comments as well. I'm always glad to learn something new. Thanks.